So our scripture this morning comes from the book of Judges, chapter 6, and it is up on the screen again as normal, uh, but feel free to follow along in your Bible as well. So this is the story of Gideon. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abedrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that you that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that happened. Gideon rose the next morning. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. But this time, make the fleece dry and the ground to be covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry All the ground was covered with dew. Perhaps one of the most well-known stories in American history of failure, or people that I associate with, uh, is Thomas Edison. So when I think of Thomas Edison, I think of the electric light bulb, uh, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But what you may or may not know about Edison was that three months into his schooling, His teacher already told him he was not bright enough to learn anything. If you look at the history of the number of items with which he tried to invent with and had very little or no positive outcome, you might consider him a failure. To add to that, by the age of 12, he was completely deaf in one ear and could barely hear in the other. And yet Edison would point back to that very thing that very deafness, and that he would credit that as a way for him to be able to focus on tasks and be uninterrupted. In a 1910 biography that was written about his life, the author asked uh, Edison this question. He said, isn't it a shame that with the tremendous amount of work that you have done, you haven't been able to get any results? Here's Edison's response. He says, I turned on him like a flash with a smile, and I said, results? Why, man, I've gotten lots and lots of results. I know several thousand things that don't work. (laughs) You maybe have heard that story. That story has become legend. And I I probably will blank on the exact context, but it's it's that he's failed 9,000. You know, I found 9,999 ways to fail. But it's in that failure that he doesn't doesn't live in that that fear of failure. So one of the things that I learned as a teacher was that the first thing, or early on, whether it be a lesson or a sermon or just a conversation, the the thing that you will be most likely to remember is that which is shared at the beginning. So I'm going to take a moment and share something right now that I want to just, it's one of those strongholds that I'm talking about that we need to tear down. Things that we know are true, 
But by our lives, we reflect that we don't entirely believe the truth. And that is this. We all fail. Say, that, you know, say it quietly to yourself in your inner being. We all fail. I failed twice, probably more than I know, but twice this morning. So those things happen all the time. Every person who has ever walked the earth has dealt with some level of failure. Or people that come behind us will deal with failure. We fail tests. We fail to communicate well. We fail to listen to understand where other people are at. We fail to speak out of love. Knowing this doesn't mean that you are being given license to fail intentionally. But rather, knowing this and living into the fact that we do all fail is a reminder to give ourselves grace and to show others grace when they do fall short. And it's a reminder that we can have the freedom to know that failing should not and cannot be our greatest fear. So that brings me to the sermon in a sentence this morning, and that is this. Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't matter. Be willing to step out in bold faith for that which matters to God. So how does the fear of failure kind of stop us or put a damper on our lives? First, the fear of failure stops us when we begin to doubt God's presence. Maybe you didn't put those things together, but let's go back into the story with Gideon. It said, when the angel of the Lord came to Gideon and told him that God was with him, take note again of what Gideon first said. He said, pardon me, Lord, but if God is with us, why has all of this happened? Where are all of his wonders that our ancestors told us about? Did not he bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midianites. And so what you need to know is that Gideon knew all about the history of his people. He could tell you the ins and outs of all of the stories, especially those that with he's, which he is referring to here about the Exodus. At, at, the, at the spur of a moment, someone could ask him a question. He was never thrown off guard. He knew the stories. And yet, just because he had the knowledge, notice here he's doubting God when things aren't exactly the way they were then. He says, where, where, where are you? Why aren't you with us? Why have you abandoned us into the hand of the Midianites? His question of doubting is not that different than our questions. We may find ourselves saying things like, where is God in the midst of our pain and heartache? If God is real, why won't he just reveal himself more clearly to me? Or perhaps, like I used to do when I was younger, I would say, Lord, just give me a miracle. Just come and make your presence crystal clear that you are here. And yet, we should take some solace in the fact that even after God reassures Gideon multiple times, what does Gideon do? He asks twice for a miracle. When we doubt God's presence, we are left to try to do things out of our own strength. Secondly, the next thing we run into with Gideon is that the fear of failure stops us when we focus on our own inabilities and background rather than his power. I'm going to invoke Emily's testimony here again for a second. She doesn't have, and she would say this, I feel completely in, uh, at right to say this, she didn't come from a background that would necessarily have pointed her or trained her as to what, what kinds of responsibilities a pastor's wife might have. She also, the background with which she grew up in, if you knew what that background was, first of all, if you don't, 
Here's a prime opportunity to get to know each other better. Ask people stories. Ask them to tell you where they've been and how they've walked and what led them to these fears. But it's, just, it's, it's an overwhelming trust in our, or, or, or reliance upon our own abilities. So listen back again to what Gideon said next. This is something I read earlier, but he said, How can I save Israel? I, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am, the, in, I am the least of my family. Listen to what he's saying there. He's beginning to look even deeper inward at his own upbringing. He's looking at the fact that my clan is the weakest. And I'm the least of my family. How in the world, God, could you use me? Why would you use me? There are so many other people out there that are more qualified. They maybe, maybe they have titles after their name. Or they've got experience. Or they just trust you. They take you at your word. Why would you choose me? Perhaps you've had similar thoughts. Maybe things like, I just have too much baggage in my life. Or, I don't know enough. I'm not intelligent enough. Think about what Edison, where Edison would have been had he listened to his teacher. If God only knew my background, my heritage, my upbringing. But we all know that omniscient, all-knowing God knows these things. He knows this about us. He's counted every hair on our head. See, the world attempts to use the wise and the wealthy and the strong to shame others. But as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 27, it says, God shows the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is for this very reason that you hear people say, and maybe you've said, that the cross of Christ was it, it's, it's considered as shame to others. We would say, why would a leader of a, uh, of a belief die? Why would he die? It doesn't make sense. It seems foolish. But we know the end of the story. Now let's go back to Gideon for just a minute before we move on. If you don't know the, the rest of the story uh, of Gideon, the first thing I would recommend is sometime this afternoon, go home and read it. Go home and read the story. It's really interesting, but I'm, I am going to give you a synopsis because it makes another point here. So after Gideon, find, you know, Gideon has gone through these two miracles that God has presented with the fleece, he gets ready and sets off on his way to take on the uh, army of Midian. He goes out with 32,000 men. The Midianites, we learn, have 135,000. Pretty strong, or pretty weak odds. God says to him, your army's too big. Your army is too big. And so through, I'm not going to share, I don't want to spoil this if you don't know the story, but he gives two very interesting tests kind of to dwindle his arm, to dwindle Gideon's army. And so by the time they get through these tests, Gideon ends up with an army of 300 people. Utterly hopeless by our eyes. Pointless. We don't understand why he would do that. Yet God provides them, he gives them a provision of, of hope because he tells them, go in tonight and go spy on and listen in to what is going on in Midian this evening. And so they go in and they listen. And what they hear, what they overhear, is a, a Midianite man sharing a dream. And another Midian army man is sitting there and he interprets the dream. And the, the interpretation is this that our army is going to be defeated by Gideon. And so they go back and report this. And so the next day, they set off to go into battle. But they don't fight the way we think that they should. 
I mean, with 300, I guess maybe there isn't a good method to play, <laughs> other than from a distance. But, but he says, go in and blow your trumpets and smash clay pots. Again, we would look at that as foolishness. What madness is this that God is asking them to do? And yet then what happens is the Midianites wake up, and out of confusion, out of whatever it may be, they turn upon themselves and end up killing many of their own men. Now some get away, and we learn later on that Gideon and his army chase after them and do eventually end up defeating this army. Now those who were a part of that story, actually in the story, and hopefully you guys just as much hearing that, Realize, if God is for us, who can stand against us? Now, we may be sitting here incredulous, thinking there's no way that could have happened. You're right. There's no way that could have happened apart from God. That is a miracle of God. He does not need our intelligence. He does not need our help. And yet God delights in faithful, humble followers. He wants to entrust us to take part in his plan, men and women alike. He wants people who are willing to tear down these strongholds that we've built up in our lives, that these fears, and in this case the fear of failure, and to tear that down. Are you going to fail? Yes, you are. But do I, do I love you enough to say, I'm going to still use you? Well, you guys all know the story through all the scripture is people in there that God uses are the ones we would probably count as down and out. We would probably not pay them mind a lot of times, sadly, because of some outward appearance. Third, okay, we're going to shift gears with our story here. We're done with Gideon for today. Uh, the fear of failure stops us when we put too much emphasis on our words. Okay, so we're going to look at Moses here for just a moment. You encounter where Moses was uh, in part of the story is when he engages Jesus, or when he meets God in the burning bush. And it's at that time where God says to him, Moses, you are going to be my spoken instrument to bring the people, my people, out of Egypt. Now take note of this. What is his response? And, and notice how closely related it is to what we just read from Gideon. He starts off basically the same way. Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. See, Moses here is focused on the power or lack thereof in his own words. But the Lord says, who gives result or who gives human beings their minds? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. A 2012 study was put out by Lifeway Research, and it was the, the, those who were involved in, the, uh, in the, the survey were people that would say they went to church at least once a month. And they were asked multiple questions, but the one I want to focus on today is whether or not they believed that they had a personal responsibility to share their faith. Four out of five at that time said, yes, we do. And yet, one of the other questions was, how many times, or have you shared your faith in the last six months? Two-thirds said no. The most common reason, and I hear, I've heard this so many times before I was a pastor. I've heard this a number of times already since I've been a pastor. Even if it's not said this exact way, but most of the time it is, it's, I don't know what to say, or I don't have the right words. Well, I want to speak to that. First of all, we've got the Spirit in us. It is the Spirit who drives us. It's the Spirit who will do the work. However, having said that, 
You don't just walk into a situation unprepared. We have a responsibility to study, to pray, to be in deep communion with God. If, if our relationship with God is struggling, or there's unrepented areas in our life, we've got to deal with that first. We've got to repent of those things. We've got to, we've got to continue to focus on our relationship with God, but then recognizing through that work, through that preparation, that God will speak, that the Spirit will work through us as we have these conversations. A testimony is a great way. Maybe you've never thought about that. Maybe you've had this fear of how do I how do I begin a conversation with somebody? They might not care about what I care about. They might not believe what I believe. It's true. They might not. But everybody loves to tell a story. And everybody loves to hear a story. And so testimony is a perfect way. And I'm going to say something that you may find a little startling, but I think it's true if people, and I'm talking specifically about people who have been around you or lived within your life, maybe prior to a moment of, sal of salvation or transformation. Okay, so in my case, none of you will really grasp this about my life because I, dealt with, I was saved when I was seven. And much of the transformation is still ongoing, but much of the significant transformation happened prior to us being out here. But here's the thing that you're going to run into. People will attempt to deny the Bible. If they don't believe in the Bible, they're not, going to, they're not going to sit there and say, oh, you must be right now. They will attempt to deny that the Bible is God's word and that it's entirely true. They might even attempt to deny why you've changed, but for those of you that have had this experience, you know that when someone around you sees you, that has known you one way, but then God's transformational work has happened and now they see you anew, they can't deny that. Again, they can deny the source of it, but they can't help but see that change that's within you. And so where is our testimony in this? Our testimony in this is, this is God's work. I have done nothing. God is the only one that could have produced such a change. So rather than seeing the gospel as having to be something that we sell, and that we have to have the right words to sell it, let's remember that it's about God's transformative work in our lives. We don't have to sell anything. All we have to do is to come and be honest, be authentic about what God has done in our lives. And we let the Spirit work from there. You may say, I'm unqualified. Heard that one a lot too. I just, I'm unqualified. You know what? God calls the unqualified and He qualifies them. If you feel unqualified, turn to God. Bring it to God. He is the one. Trust in God. He is the one that will qualify you. The gospel is the good news. I was thinking about this from this past year. So, again, most of you have realized this. I think I've shared this, not from up here, but Emily and I have both lost a tremendous amount of weight. Um, and so that's something that we, I, I don't go out of my way to, to share that necessarily, but you maybe have people that you've come across or that you've seen, and they, they love to share their testimony about the, what they've done to lose that weight. Or, or you know how they're you know what eating plan has worked for them, or vice versa, what exercises you know, whatever. And, and and you sit there and you listen, almost in awe. Even if you've heard twenty of those stories before, you hear the twenty first, you're like, man, this you know if they can do it, I can do it. There's power to that testimony, and and the same thing is true with the power of our testimony back to God's faithfulness. It's God's gift to the world. The gospel is God's gift that reveals our inherent sinfulness. We remind ourselves that we are inherently sinful, that we need a Savior, and that God provided that Savior in Christ alone. And finally, the fear of failure stops us when we are more worried about man's perspective than God's. Oswald Chambers once was quoted as saying this, Sum up the life of Jesus by any standard other than God's, and it is an anticlimax 
of failure. Now let's think about that statement for just a moment. Does Chambers have any ground to stand upon? What would make an early 20th century Baptist pastor make this statement? Well, let's consider Jesus' life and what the Jewish people in that time were expecting out of this Messiah figure. Now remember, the, the, Israel, or the Jewish people were living under the control of the Roman government. And so many of the Jews were expecting their Messiah to come and to create a earthly kingdom that would reign forever. They were expecting someone to come with power and authority and vanquish the Roman Empire. And yet, after this, you see the disciples. You know, the disciples are placing all of their hope in what they believe Jesus is to be. They, lay, they put all their eggs in this basket. They lay all the chips on the table. And then Jesus dies. This didn't mesh with their expectations. If you read back in the gospel, it, Jesus, there's, there's a story about how Jesus says, I will, ride, you know, I will raise this building after being torn down in three days. And if you read through the scripture, it says they only understood it later on. They only understood what he was talking about after the fact. Because they were thinking about the physical realm. So here they are. You can imagine that they must have been dealing with a crisis. When G after, right after Jesus died, feeling, wondering, was his life a failure? Was my following him and trusting what he had to say, was that a waste of my time? Did I fail at life because I put my trust in him? There are many stories throughout history that are similar where people did misplace their trust in someone and it did lead to, to failure. But now fast forward a couple days and imagine the joy they must have felt when they saw Jesus rise. Yet if you look at Acts chapter 1 verse 6, just to make my point absolutely clear about what they were looking for, Jesus comes to them and, and the disciples say, is now the time where you will restore the kingdom? They are waiting for Jesus to make their situation better. Now I want you to go think about Chambers' statement again when I say this. When Jesus went up to heaven, think about it from man's perspective. I know you're all probably thinking, well, we know the story. But think about this from man's perspective. He left behind a band of 11 disciples and some others that chose to stick with them. He did not conquer any nations. And the lives that his disciples would face with persecution were much worse from man's perspective. It would be easier to say, well, let me not walk this life of faith so I don't have to deal with the persecution that follows. See, the fear of failure shows up when we are more worried about our reputation than honoring Christ. When you look throughout history, there's one thing that people point to as the most significant reason, or one of the most significant reasons that they believe the Christian faith is true. It was because the, the disciples lived their life and died for Christ. They did not give it up. They did not say it was a lie. They lived it out. The good news is there is hope for all of us. Or is there hope in all of this? We worry about not being good enough or having enough to give. Remember that the only person who is truly good is God. When we feel we are too weak, we are reminded that God is our strength. When we doubt God's presence in our lives, he reminds us to look all around us for his presence. When we feel like we can't do anything right for others, remember that God's ways are higher than our ways. No, it is only when we remind ourselves that the only things that matter are the eternal fruit which we produce, that God produces in us. It's this, the spiritual fruit, it's this transformation that God alone can provide, 
and the fruit of leading people to Christ and discipling them. That is an unwasted life. So remember, as you go forward today, our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things that don't really matter. Be willing to step out, starting tomorrow, in bold faith for that which matters to God. Let's pray. Lord, help us to let go of this fear of failure that we may be dealing with. We know Satan wants to use our fears to hold us back from living boldly for you. Forgive us when we don't live in faith, and help us from this moment on to live with a bold confidence in you. Lord, help us not to compare ourselves with others. We pray instead that we keep our eyes fixed on you and to live a life that proclaims your excellence. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for the benediction. So as you go out among the outcasts and the grieving, and speak, please speak the word of life and hope. Do not fear, but trust in God's word. Watch for the Lord with eager expectation, and be generous with all that God has given you. May God respond to your every cry with mercy. May Christ take you by his hand and lift you to life. May the Spirit build you up in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in passion, and in love. Go in peace and love and serve the Lord. Amen.